If you grew up in the 1980s, or just watched the first season of Stranger Things, then you might be familiar with the word wastoid, a slang term for a person who does so many drugs that they've essentially become worthless. And if you've ever used it yourself, you have John Hughes to thank. The screenwriter and filmmaker coined the term for the movie The Breakfast Club. Andrew tells Bender, yo, Wastoid, you're not going to blaze up in here. Every language, every culture, every era has its own slang. And as these terms come and go, language expands and becomes more colorful. The proof is in the work of Jonathan Green, aka Mr. Slang, who's been collecting and defining slang for over 17 years. His Green's Dictionary of Slang, which features terms from 1500 onward, currently has 135,000 definitions and counting. In his words, what slang really does is show us at our most human. Hi, I'm Erin McCarthy, Editor-in-Chief of Mental Floss, and with that in mind, we decided to fire up the old time machine to revisit some truly terrific slang terms from history. And while technically the title of this video is Slang from the Last Century, we're gonna go ahead and stretch that a little bit and take it all the way back to the 1900s, just for funsies. Also, I gotta know, what's your favorite slang term of all time? Tell me in the comments while the intro rolls. Let's kick things off at the beginning of the 20th century with the word ampersand. We know it as a punctuation mark that evolved from the Latin word et, meaning and. We also know that in the early 19th century, it was considered the 27th letter of the alphabet after Z. Because it was still read as and, the alphabet ended with X, Y, Z, and, and, which was kind of awkward and confusing. So people started to say and per se and to separate it out. And that phrase eventually became the word ampersand. Now that you're all caught up on ampersand history, here's the fun part. In the 1900s, ampersand was also slang for the butt because as the 27th letter of the alphabet, it came behind all the letters. Plus it's got some pretty nice curves. The first cars debuted in the late 19th century, so it was only a matter of time before people came up with cool colloquialisms to refer to their cruisers. Automobubble and automobuzzard were two informal synonyms for the car in the early 1900s. And, fun fact, the term ambulance chasing in reference to lawyers dates back to that era too. There are so many slang terms for hanky-panky that don't require you to ever utter the word sex. In 1900, a man doing the deed could have said he was stropping his beak. Strop was a verb meaning to sharpen, and beak was slang for penis. You're welcome for that visual. Let's fast forward to the 1910s. At that time, telephone operators used the terms Pip Emma and Ack Emma to signal PM and AM, respectively. They originated with the military. Ack stood for A, Pip for P, and Emma for M. The phrases eventually jumped from the phone lines and gained wider usage as alternatives to afternoon and morning. I can't be the only one who wants to say them in a Cockney accent, can I? Oi! Let's meet down by the pub at 7 Pip Emma. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The colorful interjection Crivens was how people in the 1910s expressed surprise or fright. It was probably coined as an alternative to Christ, with the latter half potentially coming from heavens. Want to express that you don't care like you're from the early 20th century? Use the phrase San Ferian, which is basically the equivalent of saying, Whatever. The phrase originated with English-speaking World War I soldiers, who phoneticized the French expression ça ne fait rien, meaning it doesn't matter. In the 1920s, flappers raised hemlines to heights previously considered indecent. Their short, at least for the time, dresses were given the nickname knee dusters. The word scofflaw was created by combining scoff, to speak derisively, mock, jeer, with law, and it means exactly what it sounds like a person who proudly flouts the law. It entered the lexicon in 1924 with help from a man named Del Sever King, who held a contest to pick a name for the rule breakers who imbibed during prohibition. For the rest of the 20s, scofflaw was used to describe people who drank alcohol in addition to indulging in other illicit activities. Prohibition didn't really stop people from getting sloshed, nor did it stop them from coining creative terms to describe the pastime. Among them was zazzled, which unfortunately didn't last beyond that era. And again, neither did prohibition. Let's start the 30s off strong, shall we? In that era, the words floss or flossing were synonymous with flirting or showing off, especially about one's possessions. Perhaps this video of historical slang will give you the chance to show off how smart you are in future conversation. A mental floss, if you will. Here's a fun fact. Although dentists were recommending the use of floss in the mid-1930s, the verb floss, aka what dentists recommend you do between your teeth, is surprisingly recent. According to the OED, that meaning didn't pop up until the 1970s. If you say, I'll be seeing you really fast, you get Abyssinia, a term popularized by teens of the 1930s. 
Author Anthony Burgess loved it. He even included it in his unpublished Dictionary of Slang, describing it as so joycianly satisfying that it is sometimes hard to resist. The word boondoggle has gone through quite an evolution. It originally referred to brightly colored lanyard bracelets made by the Boy Scouts. In 1935, the term took on a more derisive connotation when the New York Times reported that the Federal Works Progress Administration spent more than $3 million on various activities for the unemployed, including dance lessons and the making of boondoggles. The lessons were given to unemployed teachers in the hopes that they could then instruct children in poor areas, but critics felt it was a waste of taxpayer money. Now, if something is a boondoggle, it's usually an unnecessary, wasteful expense, mainly perpetrated by the government. For our first term from the 40s, we actually have to go back to 1939, when actor Don Amici played Alexander Graham Bell in a biopic creatively titled The Story of Alexander Graham Bell. The actor's performance must have been incredible, because Amici ended up becoming a slang term for telephone in the early 1940s. Of the many slang terms for marijuana, salt and pepper is among the most delightful, and head-scratching. Exactly where the term came from isn't clear, but it got a boost from jazz musician Mez Mesro in his 1946 memoir, Really the Blues. While the military slang term snafu might seem like a made-up word devised by homesick troops, it's actually an acronym that stands for Situation Normal, All Fouled Up. Though you're free to substitute the more profane F-word for fouled. We covered many misconceptions about the 1950s in a previous video that we'll link down below. But one thing that is not a misconception is that the 50s had fantastic slang. Take for example the number of ways to say you were drunk. Atomized, bagged, incognitoed, and skunky are my favorites. Drive-in movie theaters peaked in the 1950s. There were more than 4,000 across the United States by the end of the decade. Yes, you could go there and see a cheap B-movie with your friends, but drive-ins were also the place for teens in heat to bring a date. And thanks to all of those high school sweethearts locking lips behind the wheels of their Ford Thunderbirds, these outdoor theaters quickly became known as passion pits. This is a slang term that I learned about when my mother mentioned it on one of my Instagram posts about going to a drive-in. Thanks, Mom. Lots of 50s slang involves slapping a vill at the end of a well-known term. You could, for example, take square and cube, which were both used to describe a boring person, and amplify them to encompass an entire fictional town full of dullards. That ho-hum co-worker of yours who barely says a word? He's from Squaresville, daddy-o. On the other end of the spectrum, there was Ennsville, which the Oxford English Dictionary describes as a fictional place full of all the good things and people in your life, like a town where your favorite bands and restaurants reside. Time to head to the swinging 60s where the slang was groovy, man. Case in point, a go-go. In French, a go-go translates to galore. So the famous Parisian discotheque Whiskey A Go-Go literally means whiskey galore. The spot was so popular among cool, stylish youths that English speakers started using a go-go to describe anyone or anything that was also cool and stylish, or just as lively as the place itself. Humphrey Bogart's film performances made such an impression that his surname became slang in two separate senses during the 1960s. One, popularized by black Americans, meant to coerce or to intimidate, inspired by Bogart's habit of playing tough guys. To Bogart, a marijuana joint, meanwhile, meant to selfishly hog it, a nod to how often Bogart smoked cigarettes on screen, and his tendency to take especially long drags. Here's a word that's really fun to say. If someone tells you to quit nudging, they want you to stop pestering or complaining. The word evolved from the Yiddish word nudgin, meaning to bore or pester. If you spent too much time in front of the television in the 1970s, your parents probably would have called you a couch potato. The term was coined in 1976 and may have come from another TV-related diss, boob tuber. If you've ever had someone shame you into feeling bad about something you did or didn't do, you've had a guilt trip laid on you. The OED dates the phrase back to 1972's Any Minute I Can Split, a novel by Judith Rossner, where a character states that nobody's sending me on any guilt trip over my money, but it had been used earlier in print in 1970 by Bernardine Dorn of the Weather Underground Radicals group. It's also the title of a 2012 road trip movie starring Seth Rogen and Barbra Streisand that I should probably watch you know, for research purposes. Wedgie once referred to a shoe with a thick sole, but it took on more sinister connotations in the 1970s. Playground bullies would grab someone's tidy whities another 70s era term, and deliver a wedgie by pulling that underwear right up into their butt crack. The 1980s were the era of the valley girl, well-off young women initially from California's San Fernando Valley who loved all things material and were for sure perceived to be like totally ditzy because there was like a lot of uptalk going on. And there's like totally nothing wrong with uptalk, but 
Whatever. The term Valley Girl was popularized by a 1982 Frank Zappa song featuring his daughter Moon. Valley Girl slang was known as Valley Speak, and tons of it caught on far beyond the valley. So like, show the Valley Girl some respect. Grody was initially spelled G-R-O-A-T-Y in the mid-1960s, and it's basically used to describe something that's slovenly, dirty, or super gross. If something is really and truly terrible, Valley Girls might have described it as grody to the max. Tubular, from the Latin tubulus, initially referred to things that were shaped like a tube, but the word took on a new meaning entirely in the 1980s. This one related to waves. Surfers in the US used it to refer to hollow, cresting waves, perfect for riding. And soon it was used to discuss anything that was pretty much perfect. When booyah first popped up in the late 1980s, it was used as an exclamation to emphasize suddenness or surprise. But in the 90s, the word became forever associated with incredible sports plays thanks to ESPN anchor Stuart Scott, who frequently used it to punctuate his commentary. If you drained a three-pointer, scored a touchdown, or hit a home run in the 1990s, you or a teammate likely shouted, Booyah! Chillax began in a very 90s way, in an online forum discussing Quentin Tarantino in December 1994, just two months after Pulp Fiction came out. WordHistories.net did track down one earlier citation, though, the word chillaxin in a 1992 newspaper. Noob is a term for a beginner, as in newbie, that was born from the then newfangled commercial internet. It made its first written appearance in 1995 in a Usenet forum devoted to the band Fish. I really dug the one guy's idea of having the noob send along a small gift with the blank, so that's what I'm gonna do, one user wrote. If you didn't know what ASL stood for on ICQ, you were definitely a noob. Regifting was a thing long before the 90s. The word was first recorded as a noun during the time of Oliver Cromwell. But it was only in 1995 that the term found real popularity thanks to an episode of Seinfeld. The actor who played the regifter? A young Brian Cranston. There was a time when dumpster fire was used to refer to a literal fire in a dumpster, but it took on a less literal meaning in 2008, when it was used for the first time to refer to a seriously disastrous situation in a pro wrestling Usenet group. I'm gonna take a pause here and let you ponder what dumpster fire might have been used to describe. Was it that time Jay Leno wrestled Hulk Hogan for the WCW, which I can assure you really did happen? Or maybe it was when Chuck Norris was the referee in a WWE match. Or maybe it was when Chucky, you know, the murderous doll, showed up during a wrestling match to promote the bride of Chucky? Or maybe, just maybe, it was about John Cena and his jorts. No, it was none of those things. Instead, dumpster fire was used to describe the animated movie Shrek the Third. Shrek 3 was a dumpster fire. Don't get me started, one user wrote. Anyone who's accidentally left home without their phone will understand this term for the anxiety you feel when you don't have your phone with you. Nomophobia, which first appeared in the Daily Mail in 2008, combines no with the mo from mobile and the phobia from, well, phobia. When you think of what a showroom is, your mind probably goes to a place where goods are displayed, like kitchen appliances maybe, or cars. The word showroom dates back to 1616, and in 2009, someone on Twitter added ing to create showrooming, going to a store to check out merch before buying it online, where the price is usually lower. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to pick up our latest book, The Curious Compendium of Wonderful Words, which is chock full of many more fun and fascinating slang terms from eras past. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.